Episodes of the Green Corn Rebellion Show are sponsored by Oklahoma Progress Now. Oklahoma Progress Now is a 501c4 organization focused on building progressive power in Oklahoma. Their primary efforts are on developing progressive content for a 21st century audience, coalition, and capacity building across progressive organizations and causes, and working to see elected leaders who are more responsive to their constituents and the needs of the many. Areas of focus include progressive messaging and communications, coalition building and resource sharing, and focused progressive policy goals. You can check out their Twitch live streams, and they go uh, live on Facebook on at noon, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Please support this organization. It's a really great organization. It's just getting started here in Oklahoma. Uh, thank you. Now enjoy the rest of the video. Hello, this is the Green Corn Rebellion Show. I'm Gregory Harden II, and today I'm here with State Representative Jacob Rosecrans, who represents the 46th District out in Norman area in the Oklahoma House of Representatives. How are you doing today? Doing well. Uh, this is like my fourth Zoom meeting randomly today, so uh, it's kind of neat. Like we can do so much now with uh, with everything being virtual. Uh, it's better for me because then I don't have to get in the car and go drive around and do all this stuff. But I've also been helping Allison Patron um, in her campaign, try to win city council out here. So it's been a pretty, uh, I'd say a productive Saturday for sure. That's great. So what all has been going on at the Capitol since session began? Well, that's a loaded question, uh, <laughs> Gregory. <laughs> so, Basically, what's happened here, there's a, a there's an imbalance politically at the Capitol. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's a super majority of, of one party, that's the Republican Party here in uh, Oklahoma. What I was hoping after the teacher walkout 2018 is that we could kind of close the gap. That didn't happen. And then and then we actually lost seats in 2020. So what I was hoping before then, too, was that at least if we weren't going to have the House and the Senate, we could at least have a, a Democratic governor to keep the balance, the checks and balances going there. And that is not what happened either. So um, basically, we're just uh, passing a whole bunch of Republican bills, man, and fighting against whatever we can um, by questioning, debating certain really re reprehensible bills. A lot of the really bad stuff didn't get um, a, a, you know, a committee hearing, which is good. But some really bad stuff also came through. Um, we have even a voucher bill, a real one, an actual um, private school voucher bill. We have a tax credit scholarship uh, cap raising bill, just like Senate Bill 407 back in 2020. Um, so, and of course, you know, I'm an educator, so I have a pretty good pulse on what education uh, policy is coming through. And we've had an open transfer bill and a, and a ghost students bill. Education seems to be a big deal this year. Um, but like I said, um, we can't stop anything if it doesn't stop itself. I will say I've never seen so many bills actually get defeated on the floor. That's because the Republican caucus is so large that they're not all on the same page. So they may bring up a bill and they've been able to kill bills along with us. Like when we see that it's going down, we'll jump on it because <laughs> like just <laughs> the Republican bill, right? Yeah. So like eight bills have actually died on the floor. That's That's up from like zero usually you know because usually you're not going to get a bill on the floor unless it passes but with that many people under that big a tent they're not all seeing eye to eye on things so that's a pretty interesting little um, angle that, that we can take but really it's going to get worse we're in a deadline week next week is uh we've already seen some of the bills are going to be proposed there's like three gun bills we already have loose the loosest gun laws in the united states so why we'd need anything else is seriously beyond me. Um, we have a, a landlord bill that allows landlords to evict, you know, stuff just bad, bad. Episodes of the Green Corn Rebellion show were brought to you by Addy Sugar Shack, located at 1228 North Interstate Drive in Norman, Oklahoma. Norman's new shaved ice concept they feature 45 flavor options plus unique snacks. They love the vibe. It's worth the drive. Policy. We have a, a bill that's going to allow um, the, the, the citizenship test to be a grad uh, graduate requirement for, for schools. And 
listen, you want to make that a test that you got to take, great. But I would like to see it not be a graduation requirement because that's going to create a whole yeah. other, uh, you know, a big piece of having to teach something, even though we already, history teachers already teach this stuff. So it's like a couple of bad things. One, discounting what teachers already teach. Number two, the reason for the bill was told uh, to us from the, the author that it's to prevent, you know, protests and stuff <laughs> like what, because, because they, what, what, what was the reasoning behind that? Because you can't peacefully protest. Cause last time I checked, you definitely can. And yeah. last time I checked, there was not a peaceful protest at the U S Capitol in the, uh, you know, in the six. So yeah. I don't know. It's just been, it's been frustrating Gregory to be honest with you. Um, but fulfilling too to be able to uh to put the gloves on and fight certain things we've even had some victories where we were able to lay over some bills because we questioned so much and actually some of the our counterparts over there on the other side of the aisle agreed with us and they you know they didn't just kill the bill they asked the author to lay it over but still those are those are little victories you know it's good um what was the what's the land landlord bill you were uh you mentioned what's that about oh yeah let me look it up for you. I have a bill tracker that I, I use and I try to track the good stuff and the bad stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know the number, Gregory. I don't remember it, um, but it's coming up. Uh, it basically, it just, uh, if I remember correctly, it just prevents to where, um, you know, right now you there's a there's a moratorium on, on uh, evictions. This yeah. repeals that. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, that, I hope that gets stopped. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's no reason to put people out on, on you know, out in the streets just because yeah. of the pandemic that has nothing that they can't control. So, because a lot of people still aren't working to the same level they were working, or even just are still unemployed. So. Yeah. <clears throat> so, what bills are you proposing this session that you'd like to talk about? Well, strangely enough, I just found out through a, a Norman transcript story that I'm the only. Norman representative with any bills alive still, which oh. uh, just kind of goes to show you um, how partisan it's been. Um, I have what's called, uh, it's House Bill 1569. It's called the Oklahoma Play to Learn Act. Um, I didn't write this bill. I put together a, a working group back in 2019 of educators, um, early childhood educators, uh, um, like 18 different uh, early childhood education professors from around the state and uh, you know, some special needs teachers and some parents and even a pediatrician and the State Department of Education. And we came up with um, what's called now the Oklahoma Play to Learn Act. And basically what it does, it puts a massive focus on hands-on play-based learning in um, uh, the pre-K through third grade. So that's the early childhood grades um, because I don't think it's even being focused on anymore. And, and that's usually the best way for these children to learn. Um, and it's not a mandate. It doesn't cost anything, but it does protect and empowers these teachers to teach the way that they know that these children learn best and the way that they were taught to teach these children. Because one thing I've heard from prospective teachers is that they'll, they'll learn how to teach uh, early childhood education at these, you know, OU, OSU, whatever, and then get to their school sites and then be told not to teach that way. So Hopefully this will be an empowerment bill. It doesn't do a whole lot, but I want it to empower those teachers. Plus because of that fact, and because I've spoken to so many prospective early childhood educators, um, it's becoming a, a piece where uh, uh, a retain and retention piece to retain our, um, uh, our, our great early childhood educators and to recruit um, more. The reason why we need that is because the teacher shortage that we have in Oklahoma, it's felt sharpest in the early childhood education grade level. So obviously it's something I've been working on. I'm very passionate about it. This spawned a Facebook group called the uh, Oklahoma Play-Based Learning Initiative that now has over 5,000 people. So it's just a big deal. And it's got eight Republican co-authors um, and uh, Senator Adam Pugh is the Senate author. So. He's, he's a Republican out of Edmond. So it's it's extremely bipartisan. I haven't landed a hearing for it yet on the floor and it's time, but um, I've been told that whenever the next uh, bunch of bills that get published, that might be in there. So we'll see. I mean, you can only go by words, like you know, I've been, been told. So we need to see it because the, uh, the deadline for house bills to get out of the house is this uh, Thursday at 11 p.m. So it needs to, we need to get it going. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think I remember you told me about this bill the last time you came on my show. And that was like yeah, it actually late 2019. Passed, yeah. It, it, the, the thought process came in 2019, but it passed in 2020. But um, and almost unanimously, and it went through a much tougher uh, path because I had a price tag on it because I mandated play-based training and in, in um, for all educators, uh, pre-K through third, and all administrators. Well, that put like a ten thousand dollar price tag on it, so I had to go through the um, appropriations and budget committee, and that's two committees: that's the subcommittee and then the regular committee, and then on the floor, so three levels. Now this one, I stripped any kind of cost out of it, made it more of an option. And um, it went through the education committee and just one hearing and then boom on the floor. But it passed a long time ago out of the education committee and never has been published yet. So it's interesting because it's basically the same bill that was passed almost unanimously in 2020. So I think now it's more of a matter of a bottleneck of so many Republican bills needing to be heard that they're not, they're not really listening to so many other bills they're even having problems getting their bills heard like i, I have many friends across the aisle and they're like yeah i can't i've got like two bills heard and i'm like i got zero <laughs> but, <laughs> but it kind of goes to show you that it's uh, kind of across the board and you know i mean we're hearing as many bills as we can but also if you're going to put up a crap piece of, of legislation we're going to question it and, and debate it so it does slow things down and there's a lot of crap legislation out there so they get kind of mad sometimes, I think, if we slow things down, but I think they understand, many others understand that it's our job to point out the, the inconsistencies in these things or the unfairness of them and and point it out and, and debate and, and stand up. Now, I don't debate too much. It's not my style, but because um, I usually will talk behind closed doors on bills. I'm like, OK, what are we what are we doing here? Can we, can we shut it down? But some of the victories I've had, no one will ever know because it's bills you never do see that come to the floor. You know what I mean? So I don't know. That's kind of what's been going on. Uh, and with my bill too, I'm, I'm pushing real hard. We've got to play warriors that actually will, will um, email and reach out to, uh, to the representatives to make sure that this thing gets a hearing. So fingers crossed, we'll find out the next time a published list comes out, which should be any time now, maybe Sunday evening or something like that. All right, that sounds good. Um, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Well, um, I think, you know, as we go on uh, talking about this imbalance that we have politically, um, I want to make sure people understand that uh, it's, it's not necessarily, I, I think people in the rural areas right now are scared to vote for Democrats. And I, I want them to understand that a lot of our uh, ideas, a lot of, um, uh, like if you just talk about policy and don't talk about the D or the R, a lot of people in the rural areas agree with Democrats. So one of our big pieces, because it's not just me as an educator up here, and I, again, I focus on education, but it crosses over to everything, um, is that we're thinking about maybe once COVID kind of slows down even more than it already has, because it has slowed down, um, and you know more vaccines are given and, and safety goes up, we're thinking about maybe doing a little bit of a listening tour, just us educators, us Democratic educators, there's four of us, um, around rural areas, just a listening tour, not, not hey, these are ideas, but what, what is it that you've got issues with? And then here's some of our ideas to handle that. So um, maybe, maybe the rest of the caucus can start doing something like that for other areas too. But I think that's gonna be something we're really gonna focus on, especially in the interim, because you know, session only goes from February till, till May. So, we want to keep the excitement going and this is it's great because i don't actually have to run a campaign finally because it's every two years and this is an off year <laughs> usually usually i'm running for office so it's nice to have a little tiny break because really i never stop running so yeah but that's it that's really all i wanted to share the fact that also that we're just fighting really hard up here um it's it's a thankless job being a member of the minority especially a super minority at the capitol here in oklahoma city but uh, as thankless as it is, it's, it's, uh, it's needed. The, the morale is really good because we're pretty tight. You know, there's not a whole lot of uh, um, like split votes or anything like that. We, we stick together pretty good. Um, and randomly, like I'm the most rural Democrat I think we have left, which is West Norman and Noble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is, what even is that? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense, man. I think me and Trish Ransom. That's it. Yeah. That's, 
that's that's literally it. Everybody else is in Tulsa or Oklahoma City area. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for coming on and chatting with me. Um, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Um, where can we find you on social media and whatnot? Yeah, so uh, my Twitter is real easy. It's just at Jacob Rosecrans. Um, uh, Instagram is at Rep Rosecrans. Um, and then, uh, you know, you just look up State Representative Jacob Rosecrans on Facebook and you'll find my page and give it a like. Uh, I, I prefer Facebook, but I'm getting better at Twitter. I've actually, I think I got over, went over 2,000 followers. Yay. Um, <laughs> which is a big deal because I was never a big Twitter. Um, and my Instagram, it, it just kind of keeps flowing. So it, it's cool. I'll, I'll try to keep all those, all three of those going active. And, uh, mostly Facebook though, on catching up on legislation, things that have passed. Um, if you really want to you know, know the most you can possibly get and, and follow the Facebook. All right. Well, thanks.